Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Atheist Experience. I am your host, Russell Glasser, and with me today is Phil Session. Ooh, hello, everyone. Hey, uh, <laughs> and <you>. we, <laughs> we hope we can keep the energy up today. We just this morning finished a seven-hour drive back from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where we got these lovely matching shirts. Oh, yeah. Uh, and we'll talk more <laughs> about that in a few minutes. Um, today is Sunday, June 4th, 2017. We are a live call-in internet-based atheist TV show broadcasting from Austin, Texas, dedicated to promoting positive atheism and the separation of church and state. Um, you can catch us live every Sunday on YouTube or on Ustream.tv. The official Atheist Experience website is www.atheist-experience.com. You can provide feedback by commenting on the official show blog at freethoughtblogs.com slash AXP. Uh, you can email us at tv at atheist-community.org or join the Atheist Experience official discussion group on Facebook. If you enjoy this show, please check out our related podcast, The Nonprofits, which is currently airing on the first and third Wednesdays of every month. You can find links at the Atheist Experience website or, uh, <laughs> whoa, sorry. Yeah, yeah, you can also listen to the nonprofits on YouTube or you stream, although there's usually not streaming video, but sometimes. The next nonprofits will be recorded on Wednesday, June 7th. That is a few days from now. As always, the cast and crew of the Atheist Experience will be going to dinner after the show at Star of India at 2900 West Anderson Lane. We'll be arriving around 6.15 p.m. or so. Uh, now, not that any of the uh, internal ACA business stuff necessarily matters to all you listeners out there, uh, but this is the first time that Phil and I have been on since uh, the annual ACA election. And um, I just thought I'd mention that I'm still the president, and Phil is our brand new vice president. Congratulations, Phil. Woo. <laughs> um, Thank you, everyone, for uh, that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, looking so. forward to another great year with the ACA. And uh, one of the th uh, things that we're going to be doing coming up soon is that, of course, the annual Pride, the annual Austin Pride Festival happens every year. That's what annual means. <laughs> um, and uh, this year it's on Saturday, August 27th, and the ACA uh, prides itself <laughs> on always having a, a booth at the uh, Pride Festival. So if you are in town and you're planning to uh, attend, then look for us and come say hello. Oh, yes, yes. We'll be out there and we'll have swag and other little material so come by and say uh hello i'm not sure who all is going to work the booth yet but yeah I'll sure be but out there we and, i think but, i feel uh, like that's awesome. one event we don't have a shortage of volunteers for because yeah, that's yeah. always a fun time it is awesome uh well i want to hurry up and get to our first caller because we have a lot of talking to do uh, but uh phil and i were just in baton rouge and uh, denim and springs, denim springs. Uh, well <laughs> two places really <laughs> Um, <clears throat> there was, uh, uh, actually, last time we were on together, I think was uh, maybe five weeks ago, mm -hmm. uh, and we talked to Rebecca Witzman, who is, uh, I'm, I'm probably going to get this wrong, but the coordinator of the Humanist Disaster Recovery Program at the Foundation Beyond right. Belief. <laughs> yeah. Wow, look at you. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I can talk. People, pe internal people sometimes get that wrong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I got promoted in February, so okay. Uh, I had I had had the same title for mm, two or three years, so it's hard. Yep. Uh, spoiler: Rebecca is back on the phone with us right now. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> Uh, so, Thank you for having me. Of course. Yeah. Uh, the last time we talked to you, you were promoting this disaster recovery effort in Baton Rouge, and Phil was already committed to go, and oh, I was yeah. like, oh, peer pressure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I really wanted to um, put my mouth where my mouth is and, and go physically down to Baton Rouge 
and I spend all weekend learning how to put up drywall, which is not a thing computer nerds usually do every day. Yeah. Uh, apparently got, you know, got well enough at it that you end up teaching others the second day. Day two, yeah. I, I, I picked <laughs> up some right. things. I use power tools. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have given you those four students if I didn't think you were capable after Thank seeing you. your work the first day. You did a good job. Thanks. And, <laughs> and Phil, you were at a different house. What would you do? Yes, yeah, I was at a different house. So over there, we were helping to put down um, porcelain floor tile uh, down. Mm -hmm. And so I, we had to learn how to uh, mix the, the mud or the, um, the portion that goes underneath the towel and learn how to spread it out, how to clean. And um, I learned how to use a wet saw for the first time. Uh, with that uh, a circular uh, circular blade with a diamond tip cover, I was it was pretty awesome. And um, some of the other tools I was fairly familiar with, but it was a fun experience. The homeowners were great. Um, yeah. I uh, oh, go ahead. well, I was going to say, uh, Rebecca, it's you know it's your program. Why don't you uh, remind people why we were out there and and what has oh, happened yeah, sure. there? Okay, uh, so last August. Um, Denham Springs, Louisiana and the surrounding area received about three feet of uh, rain within a 19-hour period. Um, it flooded the entire area. It flooded uh, 140,000 homes, 85% of which did not have flood insurance. They were not in a floodplain. Um, and so these people essentially uh, had no way to recover. Um, as you saw, a lot of people just have a eight-foot-wide FEMA trailer uh, in front mm -hmm. of their old homes, and uh, they don't have money. Um, it's a poor area. They can't uh, afford the um, materials to recover. They don't have the skills to be able or sometimes um, the able body to be able to do it themselves. And even if you are doing it yourself, um, one, you have to gather enough funds to be able to do it and then enough time to be able to do it. And, um, you know, as, as you saw, the people whose homes were working within um, you know, it's a slow and steady process. Uh, we mm -hmm. were just now hanging drywall in uh, the home. I, Russell and I worked in the same home together. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, she was an amazing person. I'll let you talk about her, though. Oh, Russell. yeah. And, um, yeah, we, I got two days in the same house, which is uh, um, not everybody. Some people switch sites mm -hmm. each day. Uh, but the, she was this wonderful woman who had uh, just retired in April. She completely owned her home free and clear. And then a few months later in August, uh, water wiped out most of it. Um, wow. You know, it was bare boards when we got there. Uh, you know, lot, lots of uh, just cables all over the place that, that are supposed to be inside the walls. Um, and we put we put up coverings for them, and I understand this is an ongoing process. So there's a lot of stages to go through to build a home, and I heard you talk about it a few weeks ago. But it doesn't really. I mean, I'm sure our viewers are experiencing the same thing that it doesn't really connect to just hear about talking it in the ab uh, in the abstract. But uh, meeting someone who was the victim of a disaster and uh, trying to fix something that she's been waiting a year to deal with after her life was turned upside down. It, it was uh, it was really nice and a lot more fun than I would have imagined. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, uh, I I, oh, I sorry, do believe you 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 had a Facebook post that uh, seemed like you might have a little anxiety over whether or not you would be able yeah. to, to perform. Yeah, <laughs> a bit. Uh, and, and and I think it came out in the uh, my first interview with you guys a few weeks ago where you're like, uh, so I'm a computer programmer. <laughs> yeah. Will so I be able to do it? So were you able to do it? I was able to do it. <laughs> and there came you go. And came back with all appendages uh, intact. Yeah. I, the way. I, I mean, I was really skittish around that sharp stuff, but, uh, you know, I used it. As you should be. <laughs> yep. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes. Healthy use it, paranoia. Use it safely. <laughs> Be, Bill, be afraid that it might hurt you, and then you'll be okay. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but it uh, it was definitely, as Rebecca was saying, it, it helped to add an extra layer to uh, what has happened, actually being there with the homeowners. Um, I was in a different home than uh, Russell and Rebecca, and the homeowners were awesome. On the first day, I actually forgot to pack a lunch. Mm -hmm. uh, 
<laughs> uh, going out there. And so uh, the homeowner, she actually, she had a standalone <laughs> toaster oven, so she popped a pizza in and offered corn dogs and bananas and everything. And she was uh, just so awesome and humble. And her husband was a contractor um, before all of this had happened. So he was actually helping out himself, helping in another room to um, prog um, you know, kind of push things along a little bit. And so we were kind of working as a unit trying to get things together and it was a, a really awesome experience hearing um, kind of how they ended up there, what they've kind of had to go through and um, just seeing everything up close and uh, let alone learning a new skill, uh, a new skill and um, meeting people for the first time that were not affiliated with Foundation Beyond Belief and talking with them. Um, I mentioned that, you know, I'm a part of the atheist community of Boston mm -hmm. and um, everything was really great. They were a believer uh, themselves, but it was no friction. We had a awesome time together and we just got a lot of good work done so it was a wonderful experience yeah we're we're having. gonna yeah. do some uh we're gonna do some visuals which are gonna unfortunately fall flat for the probably over half of the listeners who uh <laughs> listen to this as a podcast after the fact oh, but, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know i encourage you guys to go to uh our youtube channel and listen to this it looks like on the screen it is episode 21.22 uh, I mean, first of all, we've had these shirts from uh, the oh, All yes, Hands yes. organization, which is the uh, the larger organization that coordinates groups like the Humanist Disaster Disaster Recovery Group. Is that right? Uh, they often they take individuals. They're branching yeah. into a new area, taking groups, um, and so. Uh, we were all excited both on both ends to uh, get this project going and off the ground uh, to start this partnership. We've actually been talking behind the scenes for the last two years. Mm -hmm. um, and so this was kind of our test run to see how we all fit together. Well, I hope um, we all made a good impression. Oh, so right. <laughs> well. You, oh it, we did. It went, it went Great. so well. Um, uh, but, yes, so All Hands is, uh, was our partner for this. Uh, deployment. Yeah, you guys want to roll through some of those pictures? Uh, Rebecca can't see us, but we have uh, a lovely <laughs> montage put together by the uh, uh, um, the people uh, doing the HDR Facebook page. Uh, that's okay. me, Rebecca, and Phil. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, moving on, uh, well, that's me again, just bigger. Larger. <laughs> it's just the same picture. Keep going. I picked these. So. Uh, that's another shot of Rebecca looking uh, lovely. <laughs> um, am I wearing silly shorts? Is that yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or am I wearing a face mask? <laughs> yeah. Well, well, you're grinning like uh, <laughs> like you are delighted and entertained. So uh, there we yeah. go. <laughs> there you so are. Silly shorts. <laughs> yep, and yes. the silly shorts. Yes. Yeah, they're very silly. <laughs> and and gloves. Uh, moving yeah. on, uh, this is a shot I took of where I was sleeping, and I did manage to clean up all the mess. Uh, this is a <laughs> yeah. building inside a church, which uh, maybe we'll say a couple more words about in a minute, but uh, they hosted all the people, uh, provided them with uh, a full kitchen and a lot of food, um, and we slept there for a few days and had meetings in that big space. Mm -hmm. And uh, next, there's Phil. Oh, uh, dear. <laughs> uh, uh, so you've got some drywall there, too? Uh, no, uh, that was uh, one of the floor tiles. It's actually going oh, down okay. um, where my knees are. Um, I'm on those little pads because we didn't have knee pads. So the homeowner actually fished those out uh, so that we can kind of save our knees. But it's going down there on the ground right between those two. Yeah, uh, the door entryway there. So and is the there's one more I think. Yeah. Okay. Well, oh, that's yeah. I took that picture, so I'm not in it. But uh, <laughs> the one of the best parts of this was um, getting to go out and be with. I I think I heard that roughly half the people who were volunteering there were uh, associated with the foundation Beyond Belief or volunteering for that's them. Right. And these are just some of the people that we had dinner with on the first night. and yeah, uh, Which was awesome and delicious, by it, the way. <laughs> it's so great to meet with a bunch of atheists from all over the place. Uh, okay. So, right. yeah, and I just wanted to say briefly about the church. You know, you will yeah. never hear me complimenting religion on their ideas. Uh, and, I, I mean, as far as bigger picture stuff about the way the universe works and, and uh, the idea of an all-knowing creator. But, I mean, 
sometimes we don't appreciate the level of infrastructure that uh, that churches have available to host an event like this. And, uh, you know, I certainly wouldn't say that they all do that. For, for a lot of churches, the idea of charity is let's build some bigger chandeliers in the church. Um, but it was really, really nice to work with these, uh, with these people who were just so friendly to us uh, and were, for whatever reasons that they think they're doing it, they were, they were providing a service that was really needed by real people. And yes, and, and, and they don't actually take part in anything that's going on mm -hmm. in the back, other than Pastor Todd, who comes out and uh, works at the sites with us, but they're not in there saying, hey, we want you to come to church on Sunday or anything like that. It's completely separate. They've donated the back to All Hands, yep. and All Hands runs the back. Yeah, so and it's I, essentially I waited. All Hands space that's just been given to them mm -hmm. to use by this church. Yeah, and I waited till the end of the first day after working with Pastor Todd all day to say, oh, by the way, I'm the president of the Atheist Community of Austin. And he said, oh, cool. And then we went and yeah. changed the subject. <laughs> Pastor Todd, um, I, I will speak about him for a moment because I have nothing but do. amazing things to say about him. Working, I got to work with him a lot, and a lot of us did. In fact, uh, he had nothing but teams of atheists with him. All week, he just kept taking out groups of atheists to the point where one day I was volunteering in a site not with Pastor Todd, and somebody came by and they were just like, "Why does Pastor Todd have the atheists with him all the time? Does that seem weird to you?" And I was like, "Hi, I'm one of the atheists, and uh, we <laughs> love that guy." <laughs> uh, but you know, you know, he had he was very open. He asked questions the first day. He didn't really know what humanists were, and he wanted to know. He's just like, "Oh," and he just asked a lot of open-ended questions, and then he was very satisfied with the answer. He's like, oh, cool. Yay, I'm so glad to have you yeah. guys staying and, with us and, and work each, as long as you can. Awesome. Each night at, at the debriefing, uh, the FBB people would meet in the back, and uh, every time we had a meeting, you would ask a specific question, which is, did you have any bridging the gap moment, moments today? Yes. And, and yes, tell me what that means. bridging the gap moments. So bridging the gap is whenever, well, you're, you're working with somebody who's religious, and you are not religious, but you have a conversation about that where you are humanized and they mm -hmm. accept you the way you are and you have this moment where you're just side-by-side -side human beings accepting the fact that they're believers and you're non-believers and that's fine. And so we had a lot of those. We had, our, we our entire deployment was just filled day to day with moments where, you know, we were able to have these conversations with people who were believers where they're not demonizing us or anything like that. If anything, they're just like, wow, you mm -hmm. exist. That's great. I, I would have never guessed a bunch of atheists would come out here and, <laughs> and do this. Um, but also it was, uh, you know, there were even bridge the gap moments for us where I, I had a moment where, uh, so one of our volunteers uh, asked if he could play his own music. And he's like, let me just warn you, Pastor Todd, uh, there's a lot of offensive stuff. So if you hear something and it's just too much for you, here's the <laughs> button you can push to skip. And like the second song that came on is like typo negative, straight up <laughs> death metal, you know, like nothing but ex expletives. And so about 10 songs in, I was like, I'm not going to revisit this because Pastor Todd was like, oh, I've listened to everything. Don't worry about it. I, I won't get offended by anything. So about yeah. 10 songs in, I was like, okay, now he'll know whether or not he needs to change his mind. I'm going to go <laughs> ask. <laughs> you know. So I go up to him and I'm like, so is this actually okay now that you've heard them is this is this funny it's like you have no idea i you know i like music i like it in all its forms i am fine i'm enjoying myself and i was like okay and that was a moment for me where i was like i would have never that you know i i went in with this thought in my mind of what i expected and it was changed mm -hmm. and, and i thought that was pretty neat you know uh yeah i i mean if he had ever brought up uh, details of his religious beliefs, I would have happily argued with him because, I mean, you know, I think I think you can argue with somebody and still, uh, you know, not uh, alienate them and still enjoy their company and and just discuss things without coming to an agreement. But really, it never came up. I mean, the closest I got was that uh, 
I made I made a little joke because there was there was a, like a beam or something. I, I mean, you know, a piece of a little strip of drywall that I wasn't sure if it was the right size and I wanted to maybe cut it shorter. And I came over to Pastor Todd and I said, I, I need you to pass judgment on something. And I mean, <laughs> and he laughed right right off. And that was it. <laughs> Yeah, I That's had a great. I had a conversation at dinner with I the last day we were there on yesterday I had my atheist helping the homeless shirt on, and uh, one of the other volunteers kind of came up to me. She was just eating dinner. And she kind of looked, uh, trying to read the sh uh, shirt a few times, and I was like, hmm, just kind of wondering how this was going to go. But then she asked, uh, like, hey, so you know what what is that? What do you do? And I kind of told her about Austin atheist helping the homeless here, and um, you know she. You know, she was very curious about it at first, uh, kind of why uh, we were doing it. But I kind of explained it to her, like, you know, we're just helping, you know, no, nothing um, spectacular, nothing like that. We're just going out to uh, give assistance. And um, once we got past that, she jumped right into, well, hey, have you tried doing this? And you can do haircuts and, like, started offering ideas and really getting into that. And she uh, was really happy <coughs> that something like that was actually happening here uh, in a large city. And I was telling her that we serve, on, you know, on average about 200 or so people a month. And she was just like blown away and like, that's so awesome. And uh, she was just really supportive. So it was a, a wonderful little moment there, which, you know, you didn't know how it was really going to go um, because there's so many yeah. ways that it could have gone. But uh, she was really supportive. So I really enjoyed having that little bridge to gap moment with her. And we talked about um, helping out for a while. I think it was maybe like 15 minutes or so when you were on the other side of the table mm -hmm. uh, having a conversation. We were just going back and forth. And so um, it was really wonderful to make that connection. So. Yeah, and, awesome. I, I, and I, I really feel like it's uh, representative of, of all hands and the and the type of organization that they run. They have people from all over the world. People were from like mm -hmm. Greece and you know several different countries. I'm not sure. I remember I remember Activi or whatever. She was from Greece, and I worked mm -hmm. with her one day. Uh, but the thing is, is they they have so many different backgrounds, and it's about diversity and it's about you know everybody coming together, all hands, and so. Um, you know, that's kind of the framework in which they um, present themselves. Yeah. Uh, another part of it, though, is that they kind of, when they've taken groups in the past, it's always companies that work with them. Like, I think Google has sent their employees through all hands before. And so um, I really feel like like the dynamic that they set up by, not, by accepting kind of everybody that's us up in a, in a in a great environment to have those kind of moments. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, that's awesome. So that we, you know, uh, you know, you might go in with a little anxiety and then you walk away surprised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I just want to say that uh, the Foundation Beyond Belief, and in particular the Humanist Disaster Recovery Group, uh, they're awesome groups. Like when when we talk in meetings about who to partner with and who to support, like. Uh, FBB comes up all the time, uh, and they could always use uh, your money or your volunteer time and uh, just want to make sure that everybody's aware that they exist and do actual stuff besides yelling at people, which, <laughs> which a lot of us atheists need to uh, keep in mind. And if you have any aggression, you can always do a muck and gut. <laughs> yeah, you can you can take a crowbar would, to walls would, would you and, like to, and be helping. Right, that's right. Would you like to destroy something? <laughs> yeah, then volunteer with us. <laughs> yeah, I chopped up some walls pretty good with with one of those uh, rounded saw. I mean, I don't think it's a circular saw because it doesn't go all the way. I don't even know what power tools are called, but I know it's how to like use them moon. now. <laughs> it's half it's some kind of half moon saw. Yeah, or what, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> All the real manly men in the audience are cringing right now. <laughs> All right. Well, cool, but well, thank you for talking to us, Rebecca, and uh, you know, I look forward to seeing you again sometime. Yeah, thanks for inviting us out um, originally. I, that was awesome that you yes, actually follow up I... from a conversation from months ago. <laughs> uh, I know. I'm, well, I'm pretty good at following up on things, and so you had mentioned. If there's something in the area, let me know. And so mm -hmm. I was like, hey, <laughs> it's in your area. So yep. here you go. Uh, and thank you guys for coming out and volunteering your time. Um, 
I, let's see. Between the two of you, I guess you had 32 hours of volunteer <laughs> hours over the weekend. Yeah. So that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> also, uh, shout out to all the uh, FBB people who are maybe listening right now because I, I know that yeah. uh, some uh, that there were some posts going around uh, for for promotional purposes. And uh, you guys rock. Yeah, it was really awesome to meet you all. Okay. Yeah, it was good seeing you guys again. All right, you too. Right. We'll talk to you later. Bye, Rebecca. Bye. All right. Yeah, so enough. A, all right. So <laughs> enough <have> being <laughs> nice to people. <laughs> well, right before we jump into calls, let me go over uh, real quickly on the volunteer okay. events that are coming sure. up, of course, with the ATA, uh, ACA, as I usually do. So we're going to run through them. So all the information is either on our website, Meetup, or our Facebook pages, so you can find all the info there on June 17th, we will be at the Central Texas Food Bank once again here in Austin, and, and that's open for all ages. So you just go on to the event and you have to sign up through the link that's on the event that I've made. And so um, that's just the way Central uh, Texas Food Bank does things. So just sign up there, whether you're a family or an individual, and show up there on the 17th so we can help out uh, needy folks all around the Central Texas area. Um, on the 24th, that next Saturday, we have another uh, ramp build will be going on. Um, that's with the Texas ramp, or Texas ramp Project, as usual. Uh, this past time, we actually helped build a ramp for it. It was a 96-year-old recipient um, that received that ramp, and she was very appreciative. So was her daughter and granddaughter. Uh, we're both there to kind of help her experience the ramp firsthand. And she was one of, she came out um, on a walker, oxygen mask, everything just to kind of say hi to everyone and to introduce herself so that was a really awesome time last month and uh, so moving on on the 25th june 25th at 8 a.m uh, we have the uh, keep austin beautiful the street cleanup that'll be happening here in austin um, on the north side of town over on uh, burnett uh, anderson and burnett we'll start at that jack-in-the-box there and uh, go down and clean up for half a mile uh, that's also open up open to all ages as well uh, we'll have gloves and trash bags for you to use so just feel free to come out and help clean a little bit and we can rock and roll because later on that day uh, at 9 15 um, austin atheist helping the homeless will be having another giveaway for the homeless in downtown austin on, at 9 15 uh, that morning so it's just a lot of stuff going on but you can find all the information like i said online and with that i am done Okay, uh, thanks, right. Phil. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, I am going to Art in Pennsylvania. Hello? Hello? Hey. Hello. Oh, you can you hear me? Good. Good. Yes, we can. How are you doing? Hey, good, good. You guys have a good show today. Very lively, very, thanks. very inspiring. <laughs> Hope you keep it that way. <laughs> <laughs> good. <laughs> okay, I'll do my best. I, I've got a few things. Um, uh, the first premise of the Kalam is is nonsense. Okay. Supernatural <laughs> is an empty term. Why Jesus failed? Um, should I start with the first one? Uh, can, before you do that, can you tell us where, what what point of view you're coming from? Um, I have the belief in God as ultimate ground of existence, but I believe okay. Christianity is mostly uh, nonsense. All right. I should, I mean, I should tell you that you have very little work to do to convince most of our audience that the Quran is is garbage. Oh, I mean, well, no. <laughs> no, yeah. no, no, but almost nobody watching the show has has any particular regard for the Quran. I mean, you're maybe talking to like 0.1%. Oh, I, I think you said the Kalam. Oh, Russell, Russell I, I said the Kalam. The Kalam. Oh, yeah. oh the it's Kalam. spelled wrong here. Okay. Oh, no. Uh, oh, Kalam. well, then I am ranting over nothing. <laughs> uh, but actually, same same thing. I don't think, any, yeah. I don't yeah. think a lot of people have any special regard well, for Kalam. Yeah. No, it, it's not that I, I, I think that they do. It's that... What bugs me is that the first premise is obviously nonsense. And often on the show, people have accepted that and gone beyond it. Uh, and not, let's see, well, so not everybody knows uh, what Kalam uh, is, yeah. but it is okay. basically a, a sort of elaborate workaround for the first cause argument. Uh, wouldn't, right. that, wouldn't you say? Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, well, all I'm saying is, when they say everything that begins to exist has a cause, mm -hmm. 
I can't think of anything that has a cause. Everything I can think of has multiple causes. Uh, sure. And if you Complex want, if you want to run with, right, and if you want to run with multiple causes and you accept the Kalam, you end up proving multiple immaterial minds or polytheism, which is ridiculous. I mean, the people who make the argument have a first premise, which uh, I, I can't think of anything that has a single cause. So I just okay. think that the first premise is nonsense, but I've seen it go on to the second and third premise. So that, that was the point I wanted to make about that. Sure. We are so far on the same page. <laughs> okay. Let me move on to supernatural is an empty term. I think you'll agree with this, too. Since we don't know the limits of the natural. Okay. Supernatural is, is, is a bogus term because we, we, we don't know where the natural ends. I, I mean, yeah, I think there is no solid definition of what's right. natural and what's not, which is, I think, a good reason why, uh, uh, you know, our co-host Tracy in particular, when she hears words like, you know, oh, well, it's supernatural or it's spiritual, her first right. answer is, I don't know what that means. Right, because right. Usually the people who are trying to use it don't really have an idea what it means either. They just sort of right. invoke it as a vague, Placeholder. magical word yeah. that can yeah. sum up yeah. nothing, really. Yeah. Well, I, I would say that you can give it the meaning of beyond the natural, but since we don't know where the natural ends, you can't, with confidence, call anything supernatural. At one time, lightning was considered supernatural. It was considered God's uh, whatever. Okay. So, okay, I got one more. This, this will go quick. <laughs> okay. All right. Are you just calling to make our case for us? <laughs> well, or? It, it's just, well, like I said, like, I've watched your show a lot, mm -hmm. and when I've seen discussion of the Kalam go past the first premise to the second and the third, right. that's why I brought that up, because I don't even think it should get past the first. Well, when, and, when we and, have and, these and, discussions, I mean, me, yeah. it, you know, it's hard to see what it's like sitting on this side of the camera, but, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, there, there's a lot of stuff people will say that we don't think holds any water, um, yeah. but sometimes interesting discussions don't happen at the level where you're nitpicking the wording of the first sentence that they mm -hmm. say, yeah. and so... Yeah. I feel like sometimes it's important to let the argument, uh, to maybe conditionally accept the first thing they say, which is not the same thing as necessarily actually saying that they're right, right. but just saying, okay, suppose that we say you're right, let's see where this goes. Because I think the useful discussion happens in the meat uh, of what they're yeah. actually trying to get across. And, okay. you know, that, okay. that's just how it goes sometimes. Okay, okay. Well, okay, my last one is, I think you'll accept too. But okay. maybe um, even if someone wanted, even if someone accepted the whole Christian story and wanted to be saved, the fact remains that whatever denomination you pick, there's going to be several other Christian denominations telling you you've picked wrong and you're still not saved. And I think that that point which I think you'll agree with, indicates to me that Jesus failed. Because if he came to bring us the way of salvation, and all he brought us was 20 different churches, and you have to pick one via roulette wheel, and you still might not be saved if you don't look out and, you know, and pick the right one, I think that's a clear indication that he failed. And, uh, uh, we anyway, agree I again. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't think, uh, minus the assumption yeah. of uh, okay. that Jesus' character failed, but... Uh, and hold, I understand where you're coming from. The just the sheer amount of denominations and the little differences, and sometimes larger difference, differences that can exist between those denominations as far as yeah. criterion for yeah. admittance into uh, yeah. uh, the gates. That's yeah, it could become problematic on that side. So yeah, yeah. I mean, like, yeah. like if I deliver ten medicine bottles and one of them is going to save you, and the other not, I mean, you know, one of them is going to cure you, and the other nine aren't then I really haven't brought you to cure. I've brought you a lottery. Sure. But, but, but that was my third point. I, I'm sorry we can't find something to disagree about. Maybe I'll go back again. <laughs> I bet we could if like. we tried, but sure. if we're not Somewhere aiming for that, then yeah, that's fine. Could, yeah. All right, yeah. bridging the gap okay. moment. <laughs> that would happen. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks Thank for you. calling. All right, I appreciate it. Okay, you're welcome. See yes. Or, or, of course, there is always Doug. All, I'm sorry. The, the uh, we so we were recently watching uh, the 
sitcom, sitcom The Good Place, which I personally recommend to uh, all the atheists. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and one of the first things that Ted Danson, who is an angel, says is that, uh, you know, all the religions got about 5% of it right, except, but there's this one stoner kid in the 70s named Doug who got really high one night and then correctly guessed about 92% of exactly what the afterlife is like. <laughs> so so there's your way out of the roulette wheel. Ask Doug. <laughs> uh, right. So who's next? Dan in New York. Hello. Hi. 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 Um, so I'm an atheist and... Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't really have a long story. I, I didn't grow up in a religious household. Mm -hmm. I do, however, have a family that is somewhat kind of religious. And over the past few years, you know, since the, you know, proliferation of Facebook and other social media, I've started to take a stance of, you know, just making fun of it with, like, memes and pointing out things that are, you know, kind of contradictory and funny. Like, one of my favorites is Zombie Jesus, and then, you know, why, why put blood on the, on the door for Passover when, you know, God should already know what the right kids are to kill. Mm -hmm. um, but my really question is, because, you know, I, I've been watching it for a long time, and I do like your concept of positive atheism. Do you mm -hmm. think it's right to constantly make fun of religion, even if it's a way to make people think about it, or is it just a disrespectful way to go about it? Mm. Um, I guess, for me, that would kind of depend on where you're coming from and what kind of what you want to get out of it, you know, because I'm not here to tell you that, oh, no, you just shouldn't do that. You know, you, you know how dare you do something like that. But um, do you know what you're trying to get out of it? Is this more just for your own benefit uh, for you to kind of, well, or is well, it for really them, because, so to speak? Well, kind of more for them because I've also noticed that at least in my, the side of my family that's religious, mm -hmm. little by little, I'm noticing that I'm not the only one. I'm just mm -hmm. the loudest when it comes to, you know, not believing. Yeah. So I think I, as being the loudest person, just by blatantly making fun of it, mm -hmm. you know, other members of the family will feel that they're not alone and will just come out to it. But I've also had the extreme on the other side where people felt so offended that they've gone and blocked me and haven't talked to me since. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I know all about that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it just, it depends on kind of what, what you want to get out of it, honestly. You said you're doing it for them. It's not necessarily for you. It's for them. Um, well, I and mean, I, I mean, I'll, I'll, uh, go ahead. I mean, I'll be honest. You know, it, it does, I do kind of get a kick out of when I get the, the same arguments that, you know, they'll call in and Matt will shut them down and hang up on them. I do get a kick out of that. Okay. But um, ideally, you know, I, I, I like the fact that I do see that at least some of the younger kids in my family are, mm -hmm. you know, opening up to it. Yeah, that, I've seen that uh, here and there. I usually don't post uh, memes on my side. I typically uh, post my, like, volunteering events or whatever else, and I don't shy away from the word atheism. Um, like I used to quite a long time ago, I used to refrain from mentioning secular or atheists in my posts for the fear that uh, it would offend someone in my family who was a lot more religious and that they may take a harder stance or, you know, block me, which that has happened, um, or that we would, it would sour our relationship that we have in person because I still uh, love and care for them, and we still have a wonderful time when we get together, but I didn't want to risk souring that relationship over something <clears throat> as simple as a meme. And so it kind of goes, um, you say, I guess you've been doing this for a while. Um, yeah, looking yeah. at looking at that experience, is it having a more negative experience on the relationships in your family? And also, how do you feel about those relationships in your family? Are the, is that something that you want to continue? And do you value it enough to adjust what you're doing um, in order to well, facilitate what you want? Well, I mean, does it, does it bother me that some people have shied away? No, not really. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of family lives far away. But, you know, it's okay. just out of duty that they have me on Facebook and social media just because we're family. But, like I said, the fact that I'm starting to notice that I'm kind of being more of an outlet to 
the younger kids in the family that don't believe and don't go through all this church every Sunday being baptized and, you know, having to, to follow the doctrine. I mean, some of my family are Catholic, some are Pentecostal. Like, when we have a party, all the Pentecostals are sitting at the table refusing to dance. You know, <laughs> I know some of them are thinking, why can't I go have fun? Yeah, well, I mean... I, I mean, it sounds like your main concern is outreach, and there are basically yeah. uh, different kinds of outreach. Uh, one of them, of course, is presenting a nice positive face uh, and and bridging the gap with theists and showing them that, you, that you're a nice person and worth talking to. And that's one way to communicate with people. And another one, uh, you know, another perfectly legitimate way to... Uh, do outreach is to basically provide uh, aid and comfort, as the expression goes, to to atheists who may feel like they can't con confidently express themselves and they feel like they have to hide a part of their identity and just provide a model for being comfortable with who you are. And there is nothing wrong with that. Sometimes the two modes of communication come into conflict, and it's really up to you to uh, to gut to gauge who you think is listening and what kind of message you think would reach them most effectively. And if you don't care about making nice with the theists in your life, that's your decision. It's it's right, okay yeah. as long as you're okay with the outcomes. Yeah, like the basic the way that I look at it is it is. I mean, there's not necessarily, I, I can't sit here and say, like, oh, there's a right way to be an atheist or to uh, propagate that information out to your Facebook friends or family. Um, but like Russell said, doing what's right for you in your situation, you know, looking at your relationships, wh where you want to end up, what you're willing to risk if things go a little bit sour or go away that you don't expect them I'm to. I'm not really it, in any kind of, I'm not in any kind of danger. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. like my mother... <laughs> I mean, she, 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 we still get along, but if the topic of religion comes about, she, she, you can tell her attitude is that she feels she fails in some way because I don't believe my father yeah. is an atheist. And that's why I was never baptized, never went through any of it as a kid. Mm -hmm. But then I have a grandmother who prays for me every day, hoping that I find the way and obviously hasn't been working, but you know, it's kind of like what Matt keeps saying that like, you know, we get along, but we just don't talk about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you so, can... I mean, I'm, it, it's not like I'm trying to find myself. I know who I am. Mm -hmm. I'm just, this is just something that I've been noticing, a trend recently, you know, in my family. And I was just wondering, you know, what your thoughts on if I was doing a good thing by just flat out making fun of it? Or am I just, you know, am I making people think about it, but in the wrong way? You know, getting them to think, okay, if they could laugh at it, then it's sure. not that secret. And, I mean, I'm not going to tell you that there is a right way or a wrong way to do things. Uh, yeah. The I think the main consideration here is uh, how is that affecting your relationships and what, uh, you know, what kind of relationships do you want to cultivate? Um, and some sometimes it can alienate people to be, yeah. uh, you know, to be too much on the mocking end of the scale. But that can be okay if you don't care about those people. Yeah, and sometimes that works for people. Like some some people turn to atheism, or at least kind of have their eyes opened by different ways of communication. Which is why, uh, like this show has, you know, different hosts have their own methods of dealing with mm -hmm. callers and talking about things. Some are uh, more straightforward, others are more compassionate. It just depends on uh, that method. It's it does not a cure all. It doesn't work for everyone across the board, but that may work for some in your family. It may kind of uh, grate against others. It just depends on them. But um, as long as you're comfortable where with what you're doing and you're comfortable with what you're seeing and what the results are, and you're willing to go forward with that, I say just keep doing what you want to do, what makes you happy, and um, kind of let the chips fall where they may, but you know, it's, it's really on you to gauge. It's, it's, yeah. it's very difficult for us to gauge, you know, how your specific family situation will go or if you're doing the yeah, right thing. For I mean, your, so. yeah, I, I understand coming from your end, it's, it's hard to gauge. Um, I mean, believe it or not, you know, I'm a godfather. <laughs> oh, so. uh, yeah, I tell people that I, I got to, like my godson's birthday is coming up. I have to buy my godson's birthday present. And people are like, huh, what, you? <laughs> really? Yeah. Yes, really. 
<laughs> Why mm-hmm. is that a surprise? That's the kind of the same thing I got. I'm a I'm a godfather as well, a fairly recent one, and um, that's the kind of the look that I got from uh, some uh, some close acquaintances of mine. Well, I, I guess I would say friends. Uh, when I was like, oh, I'll be the godfather of you know so and so, and it's kind of like, mm, really, like you know that type of thing. But different people have different expectations about what comes with the title of godfather. But uh, but oh, I well. yeah. But I know where you're coming from when you said, um, like, your mom kind of looks at it as kind of a failure that you're not uh, a religious, uh, particularly her brand of religion. That that kind of comes with the territory. I mean, that's kind of what the Bible teaches, that, you know, parents are responsible for this new life and they're responsible for training them up. And when you stray from the flock in that way, then they take that a lot more personally that, oh, they failed you. They're, you're going to go to hell because they failed. Um, they didn't do something um, you know, it's kind of makes them self-reflect on their own actions and what they could have done, what they should have done, um, and can leave some people in a pretty depressed spot. That's just what can come with that territory. So just be aware of that. Yeah. On your side. Well, yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm not young. You know, I'm I'm going to be 37 this year. So sure. it was just really me just trying to understand if I'm doing a good thing by making fun of it and like. I mean, I respect your opinions, especially your uh, positive atheism stance. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on it, that's all, really. Well, thanks for calling, Dan. Uh, We're going to move on to another caller, uh, but nice to hear from you. And good luck sorting it out. (laughs) Indeed. All right, bye. Uh, I'm going to... So we have a caller who disagrees with our first caller and with our agreeing with him. Wow. Uh, we got Billy, who is local here to Austin, Texas. How are you doing? Not bad. How What's you? up? How are you doing? It's getting dry. It's pouring outside. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I, it's a rainy oh. outside. <laughs> um, uh, I was calling about the, the, the caller. Well, first off, I want to know how uh, the, everybody says that, that people used to think that that uh, that lightning was was God's wrath or something like that. I would like to know how people know that. Like, how do you know that that's what people used to think? Um, as far as what, what, what people didn't understand before we actually had the methods and no, tools no, of people, science to people, ex- examine that? People specifically say that lightning, or that, that, you know, thousands of years ago or whatever, people used to think that lightning was like God's wrath. I would like to know how people are, how are we aware that that is the case? Oh, how do how do we know that older religions had no, 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 beliefs? No, no. How do we know that people used to think that lightning is God was God's wrath? Um, how do we there, know that? I mean, there is such a thing as history and anthropology. I mean, uh, the the ancient so, so Greeks what, what, actually left uh, like uh, like mythology. People are, yeah. people are basically asserting asserting what what people thousands of years ago used to think. Uh-huh. And they don't have they don't have any evidence for that. They don't have any no, they, for old books. But old books old books are all compromised and so and so none of them can be considered. I feel like you are 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 basically taking an intentionally do, extreme position uh, to illustrate some other point that you're trying to make. I mean, no. if you are trying to characterize atheists as saying that books are not evidence or that written history is useless, then you are misunderstanding no, 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 no. the position. I mean, no. w- would, you say, would you say, uh, would you not agree that there is some anthropological value uh, in uncovering original written works to getting an insight into the mindsets of the people who wrote them? I think if some old books are compromised, then all old books are compromised. What do you mean um, by compromise? Correct. Yeah, that's what I'm understanding. Or, or over the course of thousands of years, um, mm-hmm. that uh, information has been altered and or manipulated in some way or just translated wrong. Um, it's it's easy to to uh, to see that that happens, <laughs> you know, uh, all the time. So um, I'm okay. not a Christian. Uh, but but I'm but I'm a theist. Uh, um, uh, what uh, what uh, do you believe? I'm not I'm not getting this. Um, I well, I mean, I support front-loaded intelligent design theory, um, okay. which, uh, which uh, you know, just due to the um, you know obvious clear appearance of design, 
uh, in nature and did we talk before? Reality, but I'm sorry. Did we talk before? Yeah, I, called, I called months ago. Um, yeah, I called months ago, but uh, but Matt okay. diverted my argument to some farting pixies bull crap that that uh that okay, didn't get but, anywhere. So. <laughs> um, but but what I what I, what I, I mean, know is like like old book like people are allowed to make the claim that. People okay. thousands of years ago well, used to well think I that mean, first of all, not. what's your time threshold? Because, like, for instance, we have writing from a hundred years ago, uh, which describes the conditions that they're in, and we we know that not all writers tell the truth. So, would you say that we can't possibly know that World War One really happened? I mean, I'm saying that all ancient literature, no matter what, is is uh, has. The potential for having been compromised. Okay, since well, we don't know, I mean, yeah, but how ancient is it. ancient? Do you think it's okay to say that Charlemagne existed in twelve something, twelve fifteen ish? I mean, I mean, I, mean, I, I, I do don't know. Do you believe the Magna Carta existed? I mean, I don't make that argument. I don't know. Okay, so. well, yeah, but I'm trying to understand the boundaries because you're making this sweeping blanket statement yeah, that uh, history uh, well, can't well, be well, investigated, well, and I don't think that's true. Well, the blanket statement is when, when people just get to assert that they know what people, thousand, uh, you know, people even hundreds of years ago thought about lightning, like you don't like we don't know what people hundreds of years ago thought about. Okay, lightning. but like, but like history is not history. okay. History is not necessarily about a hundred percent certainty, and neither is science. I mean, uh, with science, you have generally a relatively high level of confidence based on experiments that you can repeat or observations that you can make based on uh, stuff that you find. In the case of archaeology. Uh, you can have a more or less high degree of confidence that a certain theory or framework is true. And history is, uh, history is similar. Like, people will consider multiple sources in order to sort of pinpoint what a culture seemed to perceive. And so you have not just writings, but you have, like, uh, uh, discovered fragments of pottery which show, like, uh, you know, the way they may have lived and eaten and and their and their general like movement patterns nobody i think takes a takes a particular work of of past written history as as unconditionally literal necessarily but they do use it as a data point to put together that information overall are you saying that it's impossible to get any information out of that that's not what I said. That's not what I said at all, dude. Okay. Um, um, what what I want to know is what data points are being used to determine that people thousands of years ago, or whatever, even hundreds of years ago, that that human beings used to all think that that uh, lightning was created by Zeus. Well, or, or I don't whatever. say all, but right, right? Do you right. think any of them did? Um, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I okay. can't trust. All I can't do, you, do you care to find so, out? Have you studied? I mean, I'm not a historian, and I'm assuming you aren't either. But before you dismiss an entire field of education, I think you should figure. You should learn a little bit about what their methods are. But what you just said right there, you said it's impossible to find out. Right? How do you know that? Like, right? Like uh, that's quite an assertion to make. Because because if one if 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 some ancient literature is is not trustable, then you can't trust any of it because no. you don't know no, what why? trustable is. No. <laughs> how, then how do you know? How do you know Look. that people thousands of years ago thought that Zeus uh, uh, thought that lightning was 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 made by Zeus being Look. angry? How do you know that? Look, suppose I give you a list of a hundred statements, and well, I say. I mean, just a hundred factual statements, like it rained on Saturday or something. You know, uh, there there is a cat in New Hampshire that it is gray with brown tips on his whiskers, and I say, here are a bunch of statements. Uh, five of these statements are false. Um, like this has nothing to do with what I, what I with my no, argument. No, it does you. have something to do with what I'm saying because you just made the. Complete blanket statement that if yeah, some I, things are unreliable, yeah, then nothing can be trusted. Okay, it's well then how do, you determine, how do you determine what's been compromised and what hasn't? How what? do you determine what's been compromised? Look, I see, I see Christians getting, 
attacked over their book, over their fear book, okay. um, and, and talking about how it's been compromised over thousands of years, and they get slammed for that. Mm-hmm. But then I, I see an atheist come out and say, oh, well, people thousands of years ago used to think that lightning is created by Zeus, but they, but they got that from an old book, too. Like they, or, or there are, tablet or, or, okay. or whatever. And, and but, I'm uh, going to go back to what I said at the beginning of this call, which is that you're mischaracterizing the way that atheists deal with uh, with written testimony. I like do atheists that. do not say nothing about this book is uh, is in any way factual. Nothing about it is that. reliable. Uh, I never said that they do that. Right. I they do that say that you need multiple that. lines of information in order to verify something. Yeah, I mean, I see Christians. They come. They come up with all kinds of different lines of 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 uh, sources for for their information. If, <laughs> I mean, I'm not a Christian, so I don't I don't know what what that is. But but they have some seriously, uh, you know, some seriously backed up arguments. Uh, you know, with, with multiple <laughs> okay, sources. so they, now they, you're they, just they saying don't. stuff without specifying it, like. The, you can't just say they have some seriously uh, backed up arguments. Well, so, okay, Would so, you say that so, there's so, a worldwide flood? I mean, I, I don't know. I don't you know. know. Like, I don't, okay, so I don't it's trust, not all that seriously backed up. I don't trust ancient li- literature at all because I don't know what part of it could have been compromised and what and what couldn't. And so if you can't determine what's compromised and what's not compromised, then you have to assume that it's all... Then you can't. You can't. You have to assume that you can't trust any of it, because what? That's how do you know? Do what, you have I'm to sorry, that? I'm sorry. I'm no. sorry. You are saying this very confidently, as if you know this, and I don't think you do. But it's also the claims that no, uh, you're using sorry. on that portion. You're saying that um, talking about people that lived thousands of years ago, believing that uh, there was a deity that controlled um, lightning, lightning in this instance, and that that is equivalent to Christians today believing in the Bible. Well, the Bible is the claim as far as That's people, uh, people that, that you compare um, talking, oh, I guess talking early on the show about uh, how people thousands of years ago may have had a belief that a deity controlled lightning and comparing that uh, with, Christians, I, with Christians, with Christians, hold on, with okay. Christians today that believe their particular holy text. The thing is, when we look at, say, past uh, religions like Norse mythology or Greek mythology, there's a lot that's there that uh, seems to indicate that there were individuals that had at least some level of belief that a deity either controlled or manipulated, uh, let's just say stick with lightning, that's completely separate from the fact of Christians believing that their holy book is true and the claims within that book that are true. That's an entirely different point, point of, of thought because those claims have to be substantiated. The ones that happened in the past, we can point to evidence of those past religions, the way that they use deities that controlled and manipulated lightning and thunder to say that it seems that people in the past, at least to some degree, had a belief that a deity controlled and manipulated thunder and lightning. That's different than saying that's different than saying that the beliefs um, of Christians today within, um, depending on what denomination they hold from in their holy text, that those claims are true because those claims have to be substantiated. That's a whole different set of things, be, of don't thinking. Don't they all have to be substantiated though? Like the, the, this, like is, this substantiation is the existence of those religions and the amount of information that we can pull from Norse mythology yeah, and Greek mythology and the fact that they have deities that were present in those that control lightning. How, how that points that? to Look, indivi- Oh, go ahead. Dude, there are Christians today. Do you agree with that? Like, Christians uh, exist uh, uh, right uh, now. Um, dude, this, this, is getting, uh, this is getting into a realm of Christianity, which I'm not... Which I don't... Uh, you uh, act don't as if this is a separate realm, theory. like talking about Christianity and talking about ancient Greek mythology are completely different, and they aren't. Like, do you think that people today believe things like Jesus rose from the dead? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure some people do. Some people okay. still think the earth is flat. There's yeah. Do you believe that? Uh, clearly, I do not believe that. Okay. 
clearly. This is also a 2,000-year-old book of stuff. Do you think that people, uh, that people at the time when the Bible was written believed that when Jesus Bible, rose from the dead? If they, how, when was the Bible written? The like, Bible like, was written the, over the Bible, a pretty long Bible, period of time, as you can read about in uh, people who go way more in depth than I care to have written yeah, about yeah. about their studies of anthropology that show how the Bible was written. Like, yeah, it, I, I mean, know. if you want me to go into the history, the Old no, Testament no, started out as oral tradition, and then yeah, uh, the New I Testament don't. is generally attributed to four no. different authors who don't map directly to the authors of the Gospel. I mean, none, no, none of that ancient, none of those old fear books actually, actually, you know, can be substantiated at all. That's why I'm saying, like, like the the. Claims but you that believe people, that people believed it, right? I I don't know. That's the whole point. That's my whole <laughs> argument. It's like you can't assert that you know that people. So, thousands of so what you're people. saying ultimately is that if you have anything less than a hundred percent certainty, then you have zero percent certainty. I yeah. Yeah, then basically. you don't know shit about statistics or probability. You don't I, yes, understand I know, anything. I know vastly more than you do. No, about you don't. Them. Get lost. <laughs> yeah, I was really trying to understand it because it was he was talking about. I mean, the, this guy the doesn't thing. believe in math. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like the, the claim talking about people that uh, existed thousand years ago believing in a deity that controlled thunder. It's like. We can't say 100% for certain, but we can say of the preponderance of evidence that we have been able to ascertain thus far about religions that have existed yeah. in different worlds and their artifacts and their art. And um, everything that we have points uh, that there is some uh, chance that, yes, some people probably did believe this. That's something we can kind of point to. As far as current day, talking about the claims of the Bible that haven't been substantial, that's a whole different uh, realm of thought. That's a whole different discussion to have on that portion. When you're talking about the claim that people in the past believed this uh, versus the claims of the Bible uh, being true. And if you don't know one, well, you can't obviously know anything about yeah. the other at all. You just you got to right. kind of let it go and just don't uh, just don't think about yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, what this guy was saying was basically that, uh, you know, if you roll a six-sided die, this is equivalent to saying that if you roll a six-sided die, you can't get a six because there's a less than 100% chance you'll get a six, so you can't get a six, it's zero. Like, there is a distinction between having perfect certainty and having a reasonably good probability. And, you know... Knowing things about probability and statistics and applying them to the concept of, uh, of the ability to know things, I mean epistemology basically, uh, is basic to our ability to build knowledge about the, about the world around us. And this guy wasn't even making an argument about the existence or non-existence of God or about the... Uh, or, or about the notion of intelligent design that he's yammered about in the past. He was just making this basic argument at its, at its root level that you can't know anything. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, right. waste of time. <laughs> uh, N-O in Ohio. Oh, okay. Hello? Uh, I'm not sure. person in Ohio, going once, going twice. Oh, hey, can you oh, guess hello. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you just made it under the wire. Oh. <laughs> uh, hey, guys, how's it going? Uh, doing all right. Is there, um, should we just refer to you as NO? Is that what you would like us to refer to you Let as? me explain. I, I am I'm a recent convert from Islam to mm, okay. atheism, so it's kind of a new experience and I'll prefer to uh, kind of take it slow into everything. No problem, no problem. I was just talking about for the purpose of this conversation. Um, should we uh, prefer, prefer to you as, as N-O or? N-O, yes. Okay, That'll okay. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm probably not going to add anything new. I'm, I'm Just recently, I've started to think for myself for once. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's all been said, and I'm, I'm experiencing things where, like, oh, my God, this, this amazing intellectual person. Mm-hmm said something that I believed in, you know, too much, like, I just believed in right now and figured it out, 
and I was kind of making comparisons. So it's it's very really cool experience. And I was just going to list a few reasons why I you know got away and converted. And again, it's probably nothing going to be anything new, but it's kind of a nice empowering from my side to just share that a little bit. Before you, you do that, can I can just, I ask what yeah. kind of like family background you come from? That you were a Muslim in Ohio. Well, I actually did grow up in a Middle Eastern country, and I mm -hmm. came here uh, for college. Okay. Um, and the, well, that was um, your first little... mistake. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's uh, it was definitely an interesting experience, and um, I list. Uh, I know it's very important to understand the background because some people can have you know, weak uh, uh, introduction to the religion. Some people can be very, very strongly introduced, and that doesn't make a difference. Um, but um, I was going to pray every uh, Saturday, uh, I'm sorry, every Friday, and, and, and learning the, learn the Quran in school, and fluent in Arabic, and, and both reading and writing and so forth. And, um, and so that's the background. I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, so go on. I know. So again, it's just an empowering move for me, and and I've I fell in love with you guys' channel. I'm just gobbling all the material up. So uh, I think the the biggest trigger for me was the dramatic nature of all religions, as in it's too uh, there's too much drama going on. Why do all this when you just have a direct straight line to us and just make things a lot more simpler? And uh, then I realized that. Humans are the ones that really like drama. They like myth. They like to be human centric in their views, and this kind of flicked the light. It's like this definitely could be man made because why, it would be so much simpler if it wasn't that way. Um, and that was the beginning of it, honestly. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> the the thing about religion, as opposed to uh, things we discover through scientific inquiry, is that. Um, you know, science tries to converge more and more on a consensus by gathering more data to support the same point. Uh, religion seems to sort of spread out in the opposite way, where if two religious people disagree, instead of coming up with some sort of definitive way of concluding who's right and then trying to move more towards the, what the tests say is correct, they just split off and, and break up into their own groups where they can keep saying uh, that, that they've got the one truth. And so over time, religion just keeps branching out more and more because people just keep making more stuff up. Exactly. And, and the stakes are so high, too. It's an amazing system where you just, it's, you're always threatened by some sort of eternal doom, and you, keep, you just can't question anything because you're so scared. I mean, sometimes I sit down here and I'm like, oh, am I making the right decision? And I just I, I keep thinking, as long as I'm researching and trying my best to research and, and take the right choice, then there's really nothing else I can do. It's my brain, the way it is, and this is how I'm going to think about it. And if that's what I'm going to think about, there's no other way to change it. And to me, it's, it's just such a, a, a belief to just go from that perspective. Um, and, and I think you also kind of uh, might have touched on this, which is, you know, what are the chances of these physical miracles stop happening as soon as we get more modernized and, and educated? And we can actually sniff out the BS from the truth. Um, I just recently been following, uh, he's been around for a while, like James Randi, and, and how he used to, uh, not, he doesn't like the, the word debunk, but he, he can smell the BS, and all of a sudden we don't have walking on water. We don't have these miracles that uh, we would otherwise could have happened. There's no reason to do it, not to do it. Yeah, I, I, I'm not saying that absence of evidence is always evidence of absence, but uh, Tracy has talked on the show before about an event where allegedly in Mexico, I think 150 years ago, uh, at the miracle of Fatima, the sun actually moved across the sky uh, while a bunch of people watched. And I'm just saying, if something like that happened today, you could bet there would be 50 recordings of it on YouTube within 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh. And it's weird that they seem to disappear or get more and more vague and abstract and have worse and worse camera work. The, <laughs> the, more, the better the technology gets for proving stuff. 
Uh, oh, yeah, a hundred percent, exactly. And and it's um, it's one of these things where you know if 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 something like this exists, people are going to jump on it right away, like you said, and it's just going to be. That's what people want. That's what people, that's what we're asking for is that true evidence, and we're just not getting it over and over and over again. Yeah, that's. Um, I, I remember talking about that um, on one of the first shows that I did. That if we actually were able to discover, uh, you know, just not even say a deity, but say a su supernatural realm of some type, it would be just this earth-shattering uh, thing. It would just be uh, news around the world, you know, you know, papers, documentaries made about it. It would be Nobel Prizes hounded out like pancakes because, you know, we made this new scientific discovery that, oh, this, the supernatural realm exists or a, a new deity exists and this is how it exists and this is how it happens. It's not that... Uh, we don't want that knowledge. It's just that we haven't found any evidence to support such a claim that uh, a deity or the supernatural exists at all. But if we did, we would, I'll be all over it. Like, just give me more of that. Like, it would be amazing to see. That's a whole new field of science right there. A whole new physics. Like, it could be incredible, but there's been no evidence thus far. So... Exactly, exactly. And I think hopefully the, the biggest, uh, the, one of the most valuable things I've learned from people like Sean Carroll and Randy, uh, James Randy, is that you, you're not supposed to be a cynic about it. You're supposed to be open-minded and just look at the evidence. And if the evidence strongly says, well, this doesn't happen, then don't, don't say it's never going to happen. When it ha if it happens, then approach it with open mind and try to look for reasonable evidence. Don't just blindly go into it as well. So... There's a little balance, and uh, you don't want to come up as arrogant to say, no, there's no way I believe in it, even if it's true. But you also don't want to be the gullible person that just falls for, you know, a psychic or something. And, and some people just yeah. lose this kind of balance, I think. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I got one more question for you before we move sure. on. Uh, but I just wanted to ask, uh, being an ex-Muslim, uh, I'm wondering if many of your uh, friends and family found out, and how did they react to that? Oh boy, yeah. Oh, uh, the, the nobody knows honestly except my uh, non-Muslim friends and family. It's, mm -hmm. it's a very tough decision. I mean, uh, I'm gonna admit this. Growing up, you know, uh, and I, I, I'm not like this right now. Actually, I've not been this since I came to the states, quite frankly. So, but. In Egypt, I would look condescending at homosexuality. It, it wasn't something that's not unusual. And then uh, recently I realized, is this what a person that's trying to come out feels like? This is a horrible experience because you're just sitting there and, and, and don't know what to do. You feel strange. You feel like as soon as you, you come out, hopefully, hopefully now this doesn't happen. But, you know, it, it, not to the more... Far, uh, far past, that used to happen where you come out and a lot of negative impact can happen. So it's just a very interesting experience. Uh, yeah. But nobody knows. Yeah. No. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it still uh, does happen with some, just uh, with people coming out as homosexual or bisexual. Um, it, it does uh, happen on that side. It just depends on where you're from and what kind of uh, people you have around you. It's unfortunate that it does. It does uh, but there's some services like, you know, the Trevor Project was uh, an awesome hotline for uh, LGBT youth that kind of felt like they had nowhere to go or had no support, um, that type of thing. So it, it still does happen on that side, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but my experience uh, wasn't too bad compared to others that I've heard about. And it was honestly me hearing about other people's worst experience, experiences with it that uh, made me wait so long before... Yeah. declaring it outright um, to family and so I, oof, it was just it was a long arduous process over years you know maybe four years or so um, between high school going into college but you know once I got there then things then things turned out more or less okay and it became better and it it's a lot better now since I'm coming out uh, since I came out as atheist and that kind of made things uh, that made the first one not seem as hard because coming out as atheist was harder than coming out um, as gay. Um, and if you would have told me that back when I was in high school and college, I wouldn't have necessarily believed that, but that's just the way it kind of went. 
Um, it's just the, the way my family was, as religious as we were on both sides. Um, everything that I've been exposed to, every family function, everything, um, had a very, um, a very large religious theme to it. And so, uh, just the way it went. Anyway, but I'm rambling, so <laughs> let, me get you, let me let you get back. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, no, I can uh, ramble for hours. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, maybe I'll save a few questions for next week. But um, I, I did want to just thank you guys for your efforts and thank you for putting out the word. And again, it doesn't mean that everything is off the table. It just means that we're just going to try hard to find the truth and sure. we're not going to fall for the supernatural. Yeah, well, uh, thanks for calling, Chuck. And, uh, you know, I always find it inspiring when uh, people in in very se severe uh, <laughs> information limiting kind of oppressive religions uh, uh, work their way out of it. So, uh, you know, thanks for calling. Yeah, thank you for calling. Of course. Thank you, guys. All right, take care of yourself. Right, have a good day. Bye. Bye. You too. Eh, okay, so <laughs> I'm just going to say to you, Chuck in Hon Honolulu, your name rings a bell as a guy who keeps calling over and over again and pretending to believe different things. And maybe you're not, but I'm not taking that chance today, so uh, sorry. That's uh, how we do it here. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Been burned by somebody named Chuck a couple of times. So instead, we're going to talk to uh, Tom in Oregon. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you guys today? Pretty good. I'm doing all right. Uh, I'm calling, kind of calling off the cuff here, so uh, you might want to uh, eventually delete me or somewhere, somewhere. Oh, somewhere no, you're going to you're gonna be <laughs> recorded for posterity forever. <laughs> well, that's, that's okay, but uh, you may want to kick me off. I'm not super prepared. I just caught you online, and I got a couple, maybe two no, questions. No, it's okay. I mean... <laughs> I, I mean, I know it looks like we're about to sh we're 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 just out to show people up, but I mean, we really like to have conversations with people about what they think, and uh, you know, it's all it's always interesting. So, uh, what's on your mind? Well, uh, I've been struggling like a lot of Christian theists with uh, the new atheism's definition of itself. Uh, uh, okay, how they're not a worldview. Hmm? Or a belief system? Is that true? I think maybe what you're struggling with is the way that uh, Christian literature tries to characterize atheists. And I think maybe the problem could be that, uh, that you have some preconceptions about what atheists should think, and uh, they don't square with what uh, a lot of atheists say they do think. Is that fair to say? Maybe, maybe. Um, you know, I only dialogue online. Well, not all the time, but mostly dialogue online. And and <clears throat> I, my my assumption, I guess you could say, is that mm -hmm. atheism makes a truth claim, right? Um, it's mm -hmm. complicated, as they <laughs> say on Facebook. Yeah, I know. I, I, I know. I, I, know I, I don't. My <laughs> right. I think. Uh, I think where. Where we come from, and you know, I, I think it's very hard to speak for all atheists, just as you'd probably agree. It's hard, it's impossible to speak for all religious believers, because uh, you can only represent your own point of view. But what I think that a lot of people who ap a appear on this show would agree on is that uh, a lot of the time, society and culture assumes that the default position is. Uh, believing in God, and that you have to believe in God because that's the only way to make sense of the universe, and you have to believe in God because that's the only way to understand the difference between right and wrong. And the, the only real position that atheism takes is, uh, I don't think that's true. I, you know, I don't, uh, I don't accept the mainstream assumption that God has to exist. And people have various reasons for not accepting it, uh, but I think the main thing that atheists all have in common uh, is that they don't have that as a premise. It, it, it just in my own, my, it seems to me that 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 
that that definition, I guess what you just used, is kind of a cop-out that well. keeps the new atheist or atheism from having to defend itself, um, especially with the claim there is no God. Right, but I think that you're assuming when you say defend itself that uh, you think that atheists are 100% uh, certain or positive uh, that there is provably no God, and if and we just don't think that, at least I don't. Yeah, so it also um, kind of assumes that all atheists make that claim, which isn't the case either. Like, uh, for myself, I, hold, I currently have no belief in a deity, but I don't hold the position that there is no God, um, because that would have a burden of proof that's associated with it, and I haven't, uh, I haven't substantiated that enough to actually uh, hold that belief. And so I currently um, just i am at the point to where I say I currently have no uh, belief in a deity, but I'm always open to uh, some concrete, verifiable evidence that may change that position, either to say that, oh, yeah, there totally is no God, or, uh, hey, guess what, there totally is over here. Right. I so, mean, although, to be fair, I mean, if you pressed me in casual conversation mm -hmm. and you said, hey, Russell, is there a God? I would probably say, nah. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say, no, definitely not, but I would say, nah, don't think so. And, uh, so, so I mean, that's about as certain as I get. I think, you know, my experience with the world and and my investigation into religion has led me to take pretty seriously the rejection of that religion. I would say you're probably in the ninety percentile there on that. With you, what could you be think? right. Well, I guess uh, you know. Um, Somewhere along in my reading online for the last couple of days, yeah. I, I, something caught my eye about <clears throat> about the system, the systemization of atheism. That it actually has a system, mm -hmm. um, a philosophical system, okay. a, what appears to be a, an epistemology and a and a and an ontological um, uh, philosophy. Um, is that fair to say? You think? I so I think there is something to that. I mean, I, I would not uh, agree that atheism has a systematic, like, like universal position, but I think that if you look at, uh, at atheists as a whole, what you'd find is a lot of atheists don't just have the opinion on the one thing that God does not exist, uh, or, or not believe that God does exist, depending on how definite you want to get. But atheists in general uh, uh, tend to take a different approach to knowledge and understanding things than people who, uh, who are believers. Because what I've heard a lot of Christians say is that faith in itself is a good thing, and that if you can have confident certainty in things that you have, uh, that you have no proof for, that's kind of a sign uh, that, that you're a sort, sort of a strong and confident person, whereas with a lot of atheists I know, and I think maybe this highlights the kind of difference you're talking about, uh, we take a, a much more conditional view, which, which is kind of in line with the way that the scientific method approaches understanding things. Basically saying, nobody knows everything, uh, a lot of people claim to know things that they have no good reason to know, and the best way to, to approach this is basically with skepticism. And so a lot of people who come from a Christian background would feel very comfortable with the idea that they just don't know a thing and would scramble to find a position where they can say, oh yeah, that's probably true, and if it's not, then I have faith in this. Whereas if you take a more skeptical mindset, you are more likely to say something like, I don't know this thing, and I'm comfortable just continuing to admit that I don't know it until I get enough information to be more certain about it. But also, what kind of comes with that, not every, uh, every atheist is unique in their own right. They might not necessarily have that position as far as right. um, looking at evidence that way. People <clears throat> come to atheism by different methods, uh, by different reasons. It may or may not be reasonable or rational how they arrived at that belief, and so um, it's hard to say that oh, there's a blanket, um, there's a blanket frame of thought 
uh, that atheists have and that uh, if you're an atheist then you have this frame of thought so you think about evidence in this way and uh, you're critical and skeptical about new information in this way and you want to critically evaluate it. That's, I can't say that that's the definition of all atheists because people are unique. For me, atheism, uh, well, an atheist defines one question and answers one particular question uh, about do I have a belief in a deity or deities? And that's no, and so I identify as atheist. But beyond that, that doesn't describe anything more about how I look at the world, how I approach the world, how I look at evidence. I have other tools and methods, like R Russell was talking about the tools of science, um, the way I interact with other people. Um, I identify as humanist, and that's the framework that I kind of reside in for that side. That's how I um, evaluate my position in the world relative to others. That's how I interact with each other. That's how I've does find my meaning and purpose uh, for my life is using those ideals that are separate from the label of atheist uh, to, uh, to make my reality around me, to basically to define myself. It's not through atheism. That's one component, uh, but that doesn't tell you anything else about me. Uh, to learn anything else, you would have to ask me some more questions. Well, now, Phil, I guess that's where my struggle lies. I think maybe a lot of Christian theists also struggle with this, too. Mm -hmm. I've seen a video uh, William Lane Craig has on this very issue here, and sometimes it's kind of exasperating, exasperating because everything you just said, Phil, you're a naturalist, you're, um, or, or you believe in scientific empiricism, don't want to put words in your mouth, mm -hmm. but all these seem to fit with a system of thought that is indicative of the new atheism. And so... Um, it seems like that the burden of proof does lie on the atheists because they do have these, you know, these things that seem to be a part of what makes up who they are, naturalism, scientific empiricism. Um, um, there's absolutely no reality except uh, uh, materialism. Um, the, well, like I, was, I, was about to I mean, I to have to cough up some evidence for some of that. And mm -hmm. I think, Phil, you said also that some people says that, say that what you believe seems kind of crazy? Did you say that? No, I didn't, actually. <laughs> I, I thought you said something similar to that, but, but, but that would yeah, make I don't, it I don't like think Phil would say something like that, that actually. <laughs> I, I, think, I think he said that some of what we think is what you believe is crazy. No, um, I didn't. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> but, I'm sorry about that. But no problem. In your mouth, but, but I think it, it was, I get you guys mixed up a little bit, but I think it was Russell that said something ab about... Um, faith being involved with the theist, but it seems like faith is um, is what's involved with everything we do to some extent, and, and including the new atheism. That's kind of where I was going with all this. I think um, so. I I think what you're describing as faith uh, is basically having to. Uh, I would characterize instead as having to make a decision based on limited information. Like a little earlier in the show today, we were talking about probabilities. And like if you, you know, if you have a, a you know, a six-sided die, can you know that you're rolling a one through five? You can't, but you can have a certain level of confidence in the outcome, which varies according to what you're dealing with. Um, and I think that when you say everything is based on faith, what you're actually saying is that things are based on imperfect or incomplete information. And I think the core difference we're looking at is not whether we acknowledge that we are lacking information, but sort of the, uh, the relative value that we place on the ability to have certainty in the face of doubt. Because I think that you would say that having more confidence without complete knowledge is a good thing. And I would say uh, that uh, we should be able to make decisions without knowing everything, but it's best to minimize the space where we don't know stuff as much as possible. And also, um, oh, sorry, kind of to tell on there, you said that uh, just a second ago that uh, we use uh, faith all the time, every day, but what specifically is your definition of faith uh, that you're using there? 
Well, I, I, uh, um, well, uh, <laughs> Hebrews eleven one, for example, is faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Yeah. Um, I believe um, um, in a God because there's evidence that um, is very credible that um, is good to, to show that God exists. For example, you know, and let's just be simple here. Uh, um, the universe has order and design in the universe, right? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, no, I would, not right. I was, was going to say that, 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 uh, that uh, we're starting a brand new uh, line of argument, which, of course, we've talked about before, but we're actually running out of time on the show. Oh, oh, how about so that? this may not be a good time to get into that, but, uh, uh, I mean... You know, you are the kind of caller that we like to have, and I hope that you will call back another week, okay? I hope so. I didn't uh, even well, notice that. Uh, I, I, I might be able to. I, I'm okay. a preacher, so uh, I get pretty no. tired on Sunday afternoons. <laughs> gotcha. gotcha. I, I understand, but uh, feel free to call back some other time, because uh, uh, sure, I, sure. I or Matt would love to continue this conversation, okay? All right. See you later. All right, All right Tom. Take see care. See you later, Tom. Uh, so we are at the time when we traditionally stopped, but I do want to just give a couple minutes because we don't we get people from a lot of corners of the world, mm -hmm. but it looks like we've got Irene right now who is an atheist in Russia, and that's not a place we hear from a lot. True. Sure. Uh, so I'm gonna give uh, just add a few extra minutes to the show. How are you, Irene? Hey, do you hear me? Yes, we do. Oh, that's great. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm fine. We're freezing here. It's plus five by night, so we're really freezing. It's 2 a.m., mm -hmm. so I've been waiting for oh, quite wow. a while. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're going to have to keep it short because the show's close yeah, to yeah, over. Yeah, yeah, but... sure. It's like, does it really exist that the... I've never heard of a Russian family disowning a child just because he's an atheist, except maybe for those like religious pricks who lock mm -hmm. themselves, you know, underground waiting for the end of the world. So, and I've heard a lot, you know, watching your show that it ha re does really happen. I mean, what, what, what do they say? It, I know you didn't have such an experience, but what do they say? It's like, we don't love you anymore. Or like, h how come you can disown your own child just because for any mm -hmm. reason? In Russia, it's still way easier to come out as an atheist than a gay person. That's mm -hmm. true, but I can understand. I can't understand, you know, either of that. What do they? What do they say? What do they do? It's like, ah, no, sorry, God is more important to us than you. Or like, how, how I, come it it can happen? I guess. I mean, in my experience of of talking to atheists who have been disowned, it's not so much like the the parents have a reasoned <laughs> explanation of why they're kicking somebody out, as as they just basically say, ah. I've failed you as a parent. Your your eternal soul is lost. Uh, you know, I hope you'll come back to the church someday. But you know, if you keep saying these terrible things, I can't have you in my house anymore. So I mean, they cut. They they would likely kind of push off the blame to uh, to the person and say, you know, I don't want to kick you out, but uh, you know, I have no choice because you have such bad beliefs. Or that I was, uh, I was commanded to raise you in such a way, and you're turning away from that. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want to live under this, and under this roof, uh, you're going to live by these rules. Yeah, and so that, an and ultimatum, that, right? And, and that includes, uh, you know, going to church and you know, professing your belief and praying with us every day and um, X, Y, Z. And so it, it can become okay. quite serious. It just depends on um, people's beliefs, depending on what sect of religion they come from. Um, it can be a very serious burden for the parents to make sure that their offspring believes the same way that they do. And I have friends on my timeline now that, you know, they just had babies very recently. And the first thing on their post, you know, is thank God for, you know, I, I have a child now and I hope to, you know, raise them as a <laughs> God-fearing individual like that. It's just, okay. it's it the way it can come with it. Yeah, it's just like, just some crazy people. Okay, and like the other short question, do they try to capture the land? Because in Russia, there are a lot of like churches that are trying to 
I don't know how to say it properly in English, like to capture the land, you know, just uh, we like this, this very piece of land. So we want it. You can build a church mm. wherever you want. It. There are a lot of abandoned like places, abandoned areas in Moscow. I'm from Moscow, like near Moscow. They just want this very piece of land because it's better and they like it better. So they're capturing it and they're trying to do it. And they, they destroy the park sometimes. They just... They just capture it and they just build a, a church, a guest house, yeah. and it's it's theirs afterwards. Like doesn't happen in the U.S. Uh, we de uh, we definitely have a, a large uh, church. Churches try to I take mean, over as they, much they as they can here. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but not I, only I mean, they don't pay taxes, but in Russia they also just just build those things and they keep on growing and they really yeah. like capture the land and they just fight with people who have a lot of fights. We make video, we're trying to protest, so we go and they're like when you're not there during the night, they just you know just destroy everything and they just build a church very quickly. Whoa, that's oh, wow, that's that, really devious. Yeah, that's, uh, interesting. that's really interesting though. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to squeeze in your call at the last minute is because I I feel <clears> like. I do not have a good picture of what uh, life as an atheist is like in Russia. I think a lot of Americans have a stereotype still from from like the fifties that Russia yeah. is all communist, and um, <laughs> you know that hasn't been true for a while. But also that that communists are godless, and so one of the things that American politicians would threaten people with in the 50s and I maybe even continuing to the present day almost is that you know there you know what do you want to be like those godless Russians over there <laughs> what what is the religious landscape like where you live or do, do you think a lot of people um, are Christians now is, is that old stereotype still true uh, it's a kind of like I need to call back, you know. Okay. Uh, to, to yeah, to describe it like more thoroughly. But no, there are a lot of a kind of religious. It's like you know, like uh, um, I was born and I was raised as Catholic. Like a lot of my friends say, I mean, like foreign friends, Russians say, yeah, I was a kind of you know raised as a Christian Orthodox Christian, but. Uh, they're, uh, you know, de facto, they're not like really believers. They are not deists. They are not theists. That's, uh, maybe there is something. So they mm. wear this like crucifixion, but they don't, you know, <laughs> give a damn basically about it. They don't go to church. It's not that important in, in Russia nowadays. And I mean, uh, you know, you have those religious groups, but it's not that bad. Like, I've been listening to you for a while. In the U.S., it seems like a nightmare. Like, you don't get fired. Nobody gives a damn, you know, at yeah. work. No, nobody's even interested in Nobody asks you. They ask, like, Are, ain't you going to have, like, kids, you know, in the nearest future? I was asked personally, just, you know, because those things, maternity leave, blah, blah, blah. But nobody, nobody's interested, actually, even, uh, except well, for those, like, several groups. So it's not that bad. And um, I've, I've sure, got to make Make sure uh, that you and our international listeners understand that it really depends a lot on where in the United States you live, because uh, mm -hmm. we're here in Texas, but we, ha and yeah, although we happen most. to be in one of the, uh, mm -hmm. you know, one of the most relaxed cities in Texas, I yes. would have, I would say, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but Texas is one of the worst states. For uh, as far yeah, as like ha having a, a a pushy religious culture, whereas if you go hang out with people who have come from like New York or California or Seattle, um, a lot of them, th those are some of the least religious places in the country, and they are a mm -hmm. lot like what you're describing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in Russia, it's not there, but there's still a, like a lot of religious people, but they're not pushing They're Yeah, they don't, they do go to church, but I mean, they, they, we're not communists here anymore. And uh, like, not a lot of us there. There's another group, you know, it's, we do have some religious groups. Also, we have like some communist groups, you know, they're like just crazy people, <laughs> uh, just in, in, in another group. But overall, we're neither, you know, communist nor religious people basically just something like okay. closer to neutral well i'm uh we are over time uh but i'm uh, sure, really sure. glad i took yeah. your call uh i appreciate oh, your uh, insights irene and uh call uh, back anytime yeah have a good night yeah i'll try to catch you thanks a lot i'm so glad you know okay you great all right talk to you later bye yeah bye bye thank you
And that's our show. Thank you, Phil. All right. Thanks for having me. All right. <laughs> I've had a, uh, an awesome weekend with you. Yeah, um, it, it was wonderful. We, we didn't we didn't kill each other. You know, it's a yep, plus. Yep, we drove for a total of 14 <laughs> hours plus to and from some meals. Yeah. Uh, support Foundation Beyond Belief and the Humanist Disaster Recovery Team because they're an awesome group. They are. Uh, and come join us now at Star of India if you're in the neighborhood. Uh, and that's our show. We'll see you next week. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. This is Russell Glasser, host of The Atheist Experience. You know, The Atheist Experience is made possible by volunteers and the generous support of viewers like you. If the promotion of positive atheist culture and separation of church and state are values that you hold, please consider contributing by becoming an ACA member or visiting our product page at EvolveFish.com under the Partner tab. Thank you.